Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom, here on WHOS Source 91.7 FM. So thank you so much for tuning into my show this morning. We have been talking a lot about the uh, foreign policy of the United States and other countries around the world lately, but I'd like to shift gears back into economics because that's really the core of this show. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about the two differing economic systems. There is, on the one hand, capitalism, and on the other hand, socialism. And Mises pointed out that these are really the only two systems that are available to us. He said that the third um, thing is called the mixed economy or the interventionist economy. And it's where the government tries to maintain some semblance of capitalism, but intervenes heavily in the capitalist affairs. So this is regulation, this is licensure, this is all the taxation and the corporate welfare and subsidies and all of the stuff that government does. Uh, these are interventions in the market. And uh, Mises said that this is the path to socialism, that it took capitalism and changed it and distorted it and broke it so that the only other solution was socialism. Um, Bernie Sanders is an avowed socialist. We just had a show on him the other day talking about his presidential run. And uh, he talks very highly of socialism. And so what I'd really like to do starting this conversation is to define the terms that we are looking at. So socialism means the public or commonly owned means of production. Means of production are the things that we use to produce other things. So this would be um, all the resources, natural resources, um, iron, copper, oil, uh, you know, sand, all of the stuff that we use to make other things, and also the tools that we use to refine those natural resources and turn them into other things. So this is uh, tractors, uh, machines, um, uh, factories, all the things that are used to create other goods from the natural resources that we harvest from uh, the world and the earth in general. Now, capitalism, on the other hand, is the privately owned means of production. This means that individuals may privately lay claim to particular boundaries in the world and say, uh, this is mine, nobody else may use it, but I will trade with other people if there's some offering that they have that I want that I can trade my resources for. So private ownership of means of production means uh, some people own a coal mine, some people own a copper mine, and then those two people get together and trade with other producers who then further refine those resources all the way down to the consumer. And so these are two very different systems. Uh, socialism requires central planners. It requires some organization at the core making decisions about how much is to be produced, uh, where those resources are going to be allocated, where labor is going to be allocated, uh, how much we're going to harvest out of the world, how much we're going to make of a particular good. Um, all of these things have to be decided by some core and central group of people. And Mises pointed out that uh, socialism's main failure is that these planners can't possibly know what the valuations of uh, even hundreds of consumers, let alone millions of consumers, uh, especially that these consumers all have different valuations of various consumer goods that they want. Some people would want a pool more than they would want a garden in their backyard uh, and vice versa. And how many resources would it make to, take a, a, to make a pool versus a garden? You know, all of these things are um, uh, decisions that the central planners cannot possibly have knowledge about. Um, capitalism, on the other hand, has a system of prices and profits and uh, consumers going to buy the goods that they want and holding on to the resources if they can't find the thing that they actually want, uh, bidding for various qualities of goods. And in this way, there's like this built-in feedback system to the market and to capitalism that lets producers know when they're getting off track, when the consumers would prefer that they build something else. And uh, this mechanism 
creates a kind of harmony between producers and consumers, whereas socialism creates a system where the producers get to kind of do what they want to do and the consumers hopefully are going to be happy with the outcome of the product. Now, I do want to point out before we move on to the article, talking a little bit more about socialism versus capitalism, uh, that people seem to think that there's no socialism in this country currently and that uh, we're moving towards socialism and maybe it'll get here if Bernie Sanders gets to pre the presidency or something like that. But I want to point out that there is a lot of socialism by the definitions that I just gave you here in this country already. So the central planners bring you the roads. They bring you the police. They bring you the courts. Uh, they bring you money. Uh, the Federal Reserve is a political organization, regardless of whether people call it private, but it's really a centralized monopoly that has been granted special privileges by the government. So money is also a, a socialized good here in America. Healthcare is moving rapidly, if not already, in uh, in the sphere of socialism, given Medicare and uh, all of the regulations and rules that government imposes in that area. So there is already a whole lot of socialism here in this country. And so, you know, don't be afraid of it because it's coming down the road. It's actually already here. So what we're going to discuss is whether or not capitalism or socialism is a economic system that's going to result in the best possible products and quality given the scarcity of goods on the planet for various consumers. And so given that brief kind of introduction and uh, understanding of capitalism and socialism, I'm going to move on to Stephen Horowitz, who is going to argue that capitalism is actually the wrong word. It is not descriptive of the system that free market and private property advocates argue for. Uh, it is actually something entirely different. So uh, this article, again, is by Stephen Horowitz. It was written on the FEE, Foundation for Economic Education. Education.org, and it's again called Capitalism is the Wrong Word. Wouldn't it be nice if we could simply invent new terms to replace the words that seem to cause more heat than light? For example, I've written before of the qualms about using the word capitalism to describe the free market economy. The word was coined by capitalism's enemies to describe the system that they rejected. Red Plenty, a marvelous book by Francis Spufford, offers an important perspective on our discussion of terms. The book is a must-read for fans of free markets. It combines elements from the actual history of the use of mathematics to try to plan the Soviet economy, fictional dialogue and some fictional characters, and Spufford's excellent understanding of the economics of capitalism and socialism to create an incredibly readable account of the attempt to engineer a world of abundance in the former Soviet Union. In the senior seminar I teach, we recently read a section of the book that deals with how the Soviet planning process actually worked. That section got me thinking about the terms capitalism and socialism again. The term capitalism suggests a system built around capital and its interests, while the word socialism suggests one built around society and its interests. Notice how these connotations beg some questions from the start. Is it really true, for example, that capitalism is centered around capital and its interests? Is it really capitalists who benefit the most from capitalism? And on the other side, have existing socialist economies ever served the interests of society as a whole? Could socialism in theory do so? Do both of these names make assumptions about each of the two types of economies that reflect the biases of capitalism's critics and socialism's defenders? Of course, capital does play a crucial role in capitalism. The private ownership of capital, or the means of production, is a defining characteristic of a free market economy, especially in comparison to socialism and the ability to engage in economic calculation provided by the money prices of the market is crucial for the owners of capital to know how best to deploy it. So in those senses, capitalism is about capital. 
But notice that nowhere in the previous paragraph it is claimed that the primary beneficiaries of capitalism are the capitalists. What is missing is an answer to the question of why the capitalists continually have to figure out how best to deploy their capital. The answer is because they are constantly trying to provide what consumers want using the least valuable resources possible. Surely the capitalists reap profits by doing so, but those profits result from the mutually beneficial exchanges capitalists have with consumers. The main beneficiaries from capitalism are not the capitalists, but all of us in our role as consumers. Competition among the owners of private capital is all about responding to consumers' wants, and consumers benefit from this arrangement through more, better, and cheaper goods. If we want a name for the free market economy that indicates who its primary beneficiaries are, we should reappropriate the term consumerism. But consumerism is only half of the story. It's easy enough to show through the standard arguments that socialism doesn't work for the benefit of society as a whole. We know from the socialist calculation debate that eliminating the market altogether in favor of planning can't work. But what about all of those countries like the Soviet Union that claim to be planning their economies? As we see in Red Plenty, the truth was that central planning served as a kind of myth around which economic activity could be oriented. Everyone acted as if there were a plan, but the actual way resources got allocated and shuffled around was much more complicated. In Red Plenty, we meet two characters who help us see this. The first is Cherkuskin, the middleman who trades on relationships and friendships to help producers get the goods they need to meet their centrally planned targets. Cherkuskin is the personification of what Ayn Rand called the aristocracy of pull. His power comes from whom he knows and what he can get them to do for you. When producers don't have enough to fulfill their quotas because of the inability of the plan to allocate rationally or to respond to unexpected changes, the Cherkuskins come into play and move resources around to help them, and to profit handsomely in the process. Underneath the plan was the black market that did a great deal to ensure that Soviet-style economies were minimally functional. The other character is Maxim Makimovich Makhov, a high-ranking bureaucrat in the planning agency. Faced with the news of the destruction of a crucial machine, Makov has to figure out how to rebalance the plan given that one factory will either need a new machine or fail to produce the output that other factories need. Spufford gives us terrific imagery of Makov sliding around on his wheeled chair, abacus in hand, going from file to file, using technology primitive by even the 1962 standard of that chapter of the book, attempting to reallocate resources with the flick of, a, of an eraser and the scratch of a pencil. Both Cherkuskin and Mokov are functionally substitutes for what the price system does under capitalism, and inferior substitutes at that. But what's most interesting about them is that neither of them cares one bit about the consumer. Cherkuskin is all about making sure that producers get what they need to fulfill the plan, never pausing to consider what the costs were for consumers. Makov des describes consumers as a, quote, shortage sink because they are the end of the line, and if they don't get what they want, no one else relies on them for further output. It was more important to balance out production than to worry if consumers got exactly what they needed. What Spufford so nicely illustrates here is how real-world socialism and not capitalism puts the needs of capital first and the wants of consumers last. In a world where producing more stuff regardless of its value was the path to plenty, ensuring that production continued according to the plan and that producers got what they needed were the central tasks, and the black market middlemen like Cherkuskin could make a real ruble or two doing so. But unlike the profits of market capitalists, Cherkuskin's rubles came at the expense of the consumer rather than reflecting mutual benefit. 
a system where consumers are just the folks who are expected to absorb the errors of the plan, is hardly one geared to the interests of society as a whole. And a system where capital is ultimately the servant of consumers is misguidingly named if we call it capitalism. It's a difficult battle to get people to change the names they've used for free markets and supposedly planned economies. Even if we don't win that battle, it's still important for us to point out how the terms capitalism and socialism really do give a false impression of how markets and planning work. If we want to know who really benefits from markets, a quick look around the abundance that is the typical American household will answer that question quite clearly. That article is by Stephen Horowitz. Um, it was posted on the Foundation for Economic Education, and he is saying that capitalism is actually the wrong word. So one of the major claims that opponents of the market economy say is that markets consolidate wealth, that if we have a free market, then only the top most rich people will get rich and all the people at the bottom will be screwed. And uh, the article that I just read to you, hopefully, will give you the indication that this is not the case. The consumers are the ones who benefit the most from the pure market economy when the government is not intervening in it. But what we're seeing right now is not the result of unfettered free markets. It is the result of government intervention. And of course, we are seeing that the wealthy are getting wealthier and, and immensely more wealthy in the uh, interventionist economy such as we have today. But this is not capitalism. This is not consumerism, as we read in the previous article. This is due to government intervention. And so this article by Louis Renat, uh, it is called Piketty is Wrong. Markets don't concentrate wealth. The old Marxist apocalyptic fear of ever-rising inequality in capitalist societies is growing. The capitalist elite, it is said, benefit from a dynamic of infinite accumulation of wealth and will be able to soon buy everything and everybody, including the government. This fear of unlimited accumulation of wealth by a few was the main theme of Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century, published in French in 2013. For example, Piketty writes, quote, It would be a serious mistake to neglect the importance of the scarcity principle for understanding the global distribution of wealth in the 21st century. To convince oneself of this, it is enough to replace the price of farmland in Ricardo's model by the price of urban real estate in major world capitals. To be sure, there exists in principle a quite simple economic mechanism that should restore equilibrium to the process, the mechanism of supply and demand. If the supply of a good is insufficient and its price is too high, then demand for that good should decrease, which should lead to a decline in its price. In other words, if real estate and oil prices rise, then people should move to the country or take to traveling about by bicycle or both. Never mind that such adjustments might be unpleasant or complicated, they might also take decades, during which landlords and oil well owners might well accumulate claims on the rest of the population so extensive that they could easily come to own everything that can be owned, including rural real estate and bicycles, once and for all. Let us put aside the fatuous example involving a bike as a market response to scarcity. That is a negative technological shock, despite the fact that we are today a highly innovative world. Piketty actually believes that a single person or entity owning everything can be a possible outcome of free market capitalism. According to him, if the rate of return on capital is superior to economic growth, there will be endless inegalitarian spiral. If Piketty had read Austrian Economist and had mastered the economic calculation debate, he would have noticed that the unhampered market cannot lead to a solution of wealth accumulation where there is only a single individual or cartel owning everything. Indeed, a situation with one big cartel or one owner is equivalent to full socialism and, therefore, to a situation where no rational allocation of resources would be possible, as Mises showed in his book Socialism. 
After this, Rothbard brilliantly pointed out that calculability is an upward limit to the size of the firm. But this argument can equally be applied to individual ownership concentration. As Rothbard points out, quote, the free market placed defined limits on the size of the firm, i.e. the limits of calculability on the market. In order to calculate profits and losses of each branch, a firm must be able to refer its internal operations to external markets for each of the various factors and intermediate products. When any of these external markets disappears because they are all absorbed within the province of a single firm, calculation disappears, and there is no way for the firm rationally to allocate factors to that specific area. The more these limits are encroached upon, the greater and greater will be the sphere of irrationality, and the more difficult it will be to avoid losses. One big cartel would not be able to rationally allocate producers' goods at all, and hence could not avoid severe losses. Consequently, it could never really be established, and if tried, would quickly break asunder. Thus, contrary to what Piketty and other egalitarians think, unlimited wealth concentration is technically impossible in a market economy. This is the reason why a one big cartel controlling all the economy never appeared on the free market, and this is the reason why wealth concentration will always be limited. The rest of that article is available online. It is called Piketty is Wrong, Markets Don't Concentrate Wealth. The author is Louis Renat. So another complaint that socialists and other anti-free market people have against the market economy is profit. They don't like that people are profiting. They, they don't like that people are accumulating wealth from the consumers, from trading with the consumers. And so the next article I would like to read is um, from, again, the Foundation for Economic Education. It is called Who Do Economic Profits Belong To? And it's by Sandy Akita. Do we deserve to keep the profits that result from our actions? Most libertarians would maintain that any economic profit, the residual of revenue over cost, that you earn from voluntary exchange is indeed moral and rightly belongs to you. The puzzling thing is that standard microeconomic theory, which libertarians as well known as Milton Friedman have used to defend their free market beliefs, is completely irrelevant in justifying that belief. I attended a talk recently by Professor Israel Kirzner in which he addressed the question of whether economics can tell us who does and doesn't deserve profit. I won't summarize the entire lecture here, which I expect Professor Kirzner intends to publish, but I will touch on an important and often neglected point he made. Specifically, it's that because microeconomic theory is utterly useless in morally justifying economic profit, we need to look beyond one of the most cherished slogans of economics. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch. Indeed, in order to even begin seeing economic profit as moral, you have to set there's no such thing as a free lunch aside. Now, how does that relate to the question of who, if anyone, deserves economic profit? The value of the marginal product. Let's say you want to sell a new kind of musical instrument. You buy or hire every single ingredient you need to produce it. The various kinds of skilled labor and equipment, the working space, management and financial know-how, and whatever computing and power needs you require. You also contribute to production as the owner of the firm, and your contribution includes the risk you take to start the business as well as your industriousness, tenacity, and courage. You then pay each and every one of these factor owners, including yourself, its marginal value product, which is the revenue, revenue the business earns from selling what each input produces. You pay wages or rents to everyone and return to yourself to compensate for the resources you bring. Economists since John Bates Clark have used the marginal value product and continue to do so to explain how income from production is distributed. But there's a problem. Suppose after paying all the input owners, including yourself, there's still something left over. That something is the residual of all actual revenue over all actual costs is economic profit. 
Again, you've paid every factor owner all of what each has contributed to the value of the musical instruments produced. That means that the value of the marginal product, the central concept in the modern microeconomic theory of income distribution, cannot explain who deserves to keep the economic profit because it cannot explain profit. It's important to keep in mind that economic profit is not earned in the same sense that wages and rents are earned. It's what's left over after all other earned income has been paid out according to the value of its marginal product. To whom, then, does economic profit properly belong? The concept of entrepreneurship offers a clue. For Kersner and other economists working in the tradition of Austrian economics, the key to answering that question, though not com the complete answer, begins with the concept of discovery. There is knowledge that we don't possess because we choose not to know it. If someone asked me for the phone number of a person whose name is drawn randomly out of the New York City telephone directory, the chances are very good that I would not know it. Although I'm aware of the existence of the directory, I haven't memorized it simply because I haven't deemed it worthwhile. I have chosen not to know. But if I didn't even know of the existence of such a directory, and I needed to call a particular person, my learning about the directory would come as a revelation. Moreover, I wouldn't have found out that I didn't even know what I didn't know, what Professor Kersner calls sheer ignorance. He then defines entrepreneurship as that aspect of human action that discovers and thereby removes sheer ignorance. What does the discovery of sheer ignorance result in? Economic profit. Why marshal all the resources to produce a new musical instrument? Because you believe you see what no one else sees. You believe that it offers a better investment for you than what you're doing now. Why do you think that? Because you've realized, or you've made the discovery, that after compensating all the factors of production with the value of their marginal product, there will still be a pure residual leftover that you couldn't have gotten doing anything else. If you're right, you get that residual, the economic profit. If you're wrong, you suffer the economic loss. This means, of course, that there's no such thing as a free lunch is wrong. Opportunities to make economic profit do exist. There are free lunches. In fact, in a world of sheer ignorance such as ours, free lunches are everywhere. I haven't mentioned how Professor Kersner addresses the issue of whether economic profit is moral or deserved. He talks a lot about this, however, in his book, Discovery, Capitalism, and Distributive Justice. A good economist needs to have a firm grasp on standard microeconomic theory, supply and demand analysis, and all that. At the same time, it's important for her to appreciate its limits, which are severe indeed on the question of the morality, or even on the origin, of economic profit. That article is by Sandy Aikida. It is called, Who Do Economic Profits Belong To? So, we've been talking about capitalism and socialism, and we've talked about some of the arguments that people have against the free market or capitalist society, and we've also talked about whether or not we should even continue to keep calling this a capitalist society, because the name is very misleading. The primary beneficiaries of capitalism are not the capitalists, but rather they are the consumers, and the consumers are all of society. The owners of capital are very few and small of a minority. And had we not had all these government interventions, capital would not be accumulating in such a large degree to those small, wealthy minority. Instead, it would be dispersed amongst all of society. And so uh, socialism actually better describes the free market economy than it does the centrally uh, planned and politically connected few who divert resources for their own special projects. So I hope that you've enjoyed this. This has been a presentation of the Austrian Circle. We'll be back next week, Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. Have a great week. Take care.